So in this online lecture, what we're going to do is see how organometallic reagents react, at least one reaction, okay? They do a lot of things, but we're just going to focus on one for this lecture here, and let's talk about our key points. Number one, we're going to see that Grignard and organolithium reagents play a nucleophilic role. Number two, we're also going to see that Grignard reagents attach to the less substituted or more accessible carbon in an epoxide ring. We've seen something like this before. I'll remind you about it when we get to it. And three, what we're trying to get out of this lecture is that Grignard reagents can be quenched by protons. Therefore, protection may be necessary. That's all going to make sense in a second here. So let's start right here. We're going to use an organolithium, and we're going to see how he behaves with an epoxide. So this is our reaction. How do organometallic reagents react with an epoxide ring? Now, in a previous lecture, we learned about base promoted epoxide ring opening. And what you're going to see, that's basically what this reaction is. If you understood that lecture and know everything about it, you're just going to see it all happen again right here. But just to be sure, let's make sure we understand how this is all happening, okay? Remember, in the epoxide, the oxygen, remember, is more electronegative than the carbon. So the carbon would have a partially positive charge, and the more electronegative oxygen would therefore be partially negative. And remember, that means that this carbon in the epoxide ring there has electrophilic ability, right? He's an electrophile. And we've learned before that, remember, organolithiums are very nucleophilic. So there's our matchup there. Nucleophiles are attracted to electrophiles. So the first step of this mechanism would look something like this. The electrons on the nucleophile here would attack the electrophilic carbon there. And because of that new connection, that carbon that we attacked would have too many bonds if this is the only thing that happened here. So what happens is the electrons in the epoxide ring connected to that oxygen have to let go like this, move up on top of that oxygen, so let's see what we get here. We end up with this product right here. And we also end up with a side product, not as important, but just for you to know who went where, we get a lithium plus. And let's talk about what connections were made here. Make sure you see this, don't get lost here. The methyl in the organolithium is right here in the product. And the epoxide that we attack, these two carbons, is this right here. So that's the connections, make sure you register that. And let's talk about where we're gonna go from here. Remember, as smart orgo students, we know that we can't end here because that oxygen has that negative charge, he's unstable. So what is it that we're gonna do here to stabilize him? Well, if you remember from base promoted ring opening of an epoxide, was that there was always a second step, you followed it with H3O plus. And that's simply just to protonate that oxygen so that we can get him back to neutrality. So the last step of the mechanism is these electrons go over here, attach to that hydrogen. It's just an acid-base reaction. And we end up with this as a product. Notice I have an alcohol. Notice it's three carbons long. So we made a new carbon-carbon bond here. And we've also created an alcohol. That is our product. And if you remember, that's nothing other than base promoted epoxide ring opening with the organolithium acting as the base. So that's how he works, but we have another organometallic reagent. Remember, we've learned before that the other one is called the Grignard reagent. Here he is. I just want to show you that he does the same exact thing. The carbon is partially positive, like we saw. The oxygen, remember, still partially negative making this carbon electrophilic. And of course, the Grignard is also nucleophilic as well, just like the organolithium, which means the mechanism would look like this. The electrons would come from the nucleophilic carbon to the electrophilic carbon. Again, we would bust open that ring, electrons jump up on the oxygen, and we end up with this right here as a result. And why not? Let's look at the side products. You'd also get Mg plus two, he breaks away, and the Br breaks away, so you have Br minus floating around in solution here. Not important, but just they're there. And why not here, let's just make sure we see what went there, we make the right connections here. It's this two carbon fragment of the Grignard reagent is this part right here, and the epoxide ring that we attacked, these two carbons are these two carbons right here. So that's the connection. Again, make sure you register that.
Where does this reaction end? Remember, we know the oxygen, the negative charge on that oxygen can't end this way. And of course, we always follow it up, remember, with the H3O plus, the acid step, which means we're going to protonate that oxygen like this. And again, we end up with an alcohol, which ends up being the product of our reaction. So there it is, organolithiums and grignard reagents, how they behave with an epoxide. However, this is the very simple case. I want you to look at that epoxide here that we're reacting. That is a symmetrical epoxide, which means basically the two carbons in the epoxide are identical. They're both CH2s. They're both connected to the oxygen. But however, let's do this. This is some of the decisions that we're going to have to make on an exam. Look what happens in this case. We got our epoxide. Remember, the oxygen partially negative, and we also know that the carbon right here is partially positive. But if you remember correctly, this carbon is also partially positive, which means that our Grignard reagent could possibly attack either this carbon here in the epoxide or this one right here. The question is, which one does he attack? Well, if you remember correctly, in base promoted ring opening, the base always attacked this carbon right here. Which carbon is that? Well, one way to think about him, remember, is he's the less substituted. Remember, we say substituted, we mean by other carbons. Or another way you could think of him is that carbon is more accessible because he's on the end of the molecule, whereas the other carbon in the epoxide is more in the middle, there's more steric strain. So the Grignard reagent can more easily access the right carbon, right-hand carbon, that is, in the epoxide ring. Now remember, we talked about this before in base promoted epoxide ring opening. Remember, we basically said that the mechanism here was very SN2. And we also talked about that as well. SN2 mechanisms, remember, have the nucleophile attack always the more accessible carbon, the less substituted carbon. However you want to look at that, it's up to you just as long as you understand it. However, why don't we do this now? Let's finish off this reaction right here. Let's move this up. Remember, after the Grignard reagent attacks the carbon, the electrons will boot up on the O here. We'll end up with this as a result. And of course, why not? Let's make sure we know who went where. Take a few seconds and make sure you see how these things were connected to each other. And how does it end? Remember, the oxygen, negative oxygen there is not stable, so we need to somehow protonate him. So we know in a second step, we will add again the H3O+. We will protonate him to OH, and then this will be our product of our reaction. So that's how we decide which carbon in the epoxide ring that the Grignard would attack. Like I said, it might be a decision you need to make on an exam. Now you know what to do here. But remember, we also talked about in the key points that Grignard reagents can be quenched. And what does that mean, quenched? It's not my term. That's actually the official orgo term that they use. Well, let me show you what that means, basically. Let's say you have this same Grignard reagent, and you put it in water. Remember, we saw before that Grignard reagents are not only nucleophilic, but they can also act as bases. And again, the carbon directly connected to the Mg that is not only the nucleophilic carbon, but we can consider him the basic carbon. So what would happen here is just a simple acid-base reaction with water acting as the acid. We would protonate the carbon in the Grignard, and you would end up with this as a result right here. Notice our proton, the hydrogen, the green hydrogen there, is on the carbon that was once bonded to the Mg. And just in case I get this question a lot, what happens to the MgBr? Well, he becomes MgBr plus. And remember, the water, after he donates a proton, he's now OH minus. And the OH minus and the MgBr plus simply just make a salt. But the more important product is the one above. We get just a simple alkane. What we would say here is that if this happened, you would say your Grignard was quenched by water. And basically that means almost like saying destroyed or rendered unreactive. Notice, look at our product there. That's just an alkane, a two-carbon alkane that is a no longer a reactive molecule. So why are we looking at this here? Well, the first thing I want you to know is obviously when you're using a Grignard reagent, never use water as a solvent because simply the water will react with it as we can see here. And another thing too is that means that Grignard reagents are you can say susceptible to acidic protons. 
Meaning if you're going to do a reaction using a Grignard, and let's say your molecule happens to have, let's say, an alcohol, an OH group. Well, the OH group is acidic enough to actually protonate or quench your Grignard, which means you have to watch out for that. Meaning you might have to protect that OH group by changing it temporarily into something else, which is another thing that we saw before. So you have to watch out for that. We'll see this with other practice questions later on, but all I'm doing right now is planting the seed here, and that is watch out for acidic protons when it comes to Grignard reagents. Another thing I want to show you here is, let's say you use this Grignard reagent right here, but instead of H2O, we use D2O. I just want to show you this because sometimes some textbooks, some professors put this on an exam because they want to make sure you know what gets connected where. Again, remember we know that what would happen here is that we would protonate the Grignard reagent with D instead of hydrogen, which means the D would end up on this carbon right here. Remember, this is just your professor's way of testing you on whether or not you know who goes where and what gets connected. So watch out for that. You'll see that, remember, deuterium is just heavy hydrogen or radioactive hydrogen or a way to um, label hydrogen. So that's all I want you to know about this. Now, that's the basics here. Let's put this to work here. Let's look at a sample question. Look at this problem right here. Synthesize the following molecule given the precursor. So we want to go from left to right. And what I want to do is, number one, I want to show you the strategy here. And two, I want to talk about what would make you think Grignard about this particular problem. Imagine if this were on a test here, what would make you think, hey, you know, I should use a Grignard? Well, let me show you what you would think. First of all, look at your molecule on the left compared to the molecule that we're making on the right. The molecule on the right clearly has more carbons. So you might think to yourself, well, I know I need to add carbons in order to make this molecule. And if I need to add carbons right there, you should be thinking Grignard. Because remember, Grignard adds carbons and makes more carbon-carbon bonds. And here's another thing that would make you not only think Grignard, but think epoxide, is that not only do we want to add carbons, but we want to have an OH, an alcohol, as a product. Remember, we saw that when you react either organolithiums or Grignards with epoxides, you increase the number of carbons and you get an alcohol as a product. So let's do this. Let's do a little bit of retrosynthesis. We'll take that product back just simply one step. We talked about how to do this before. And in order to get that as a product, what is the Grignard reagent and what is the epoxide that I would have to put together in order to get that? Well, if you think about it, basically what you got is this. If I have this Grignard right here and I react him with this epoxide, and remember, Every time I react with an epoxide, I got to follow it up with H3O plus. Then I would get that product right there. Let me just prove that to you here. Remember, the carbon connected to the Mg in the Grignard would be nucleophilic. He would go over here, attack this carbon, and the electrons would boot up on the O like that. And uh, let's make sure we see the connections. This carbon right here, this green one, would be directly connected now to this blue carbon there in the epoxide. And where is that in our product? Well, remember, there's that six-membered ring, so the green carbon would be here, and the blue carbon that we attacked would be this carbon right here. Now, remember also in the epoxide, it has that other carbon right here, this yellow carbon. He would be right here in the product like that. So that's who got connected to what here. Uh, make sure you see that. Remember, after we attack the epoxide too, remember this oxygen in the epoxide he would be this oxygen right here. He gets protonated by the second step of this reaction, and that proton that goes on him right here, this H, remember, came from the acid in the H3O plus step here. So that's who went where, and notice I have moved back one retrosynthetic step. The question is, how do I turn the left-hand molecule here, this cyclohexane with an OH, how do I turn him into a Grignard? Well, remember, we learned in a previous lecture how to make Grignards. Remember, you make them by taking alkyl halides and reacting them with Mg. So you might be thinking to yourself, or you should be thinking to yourself, I got to turn that alcohol into a halogen so then I can add Mg to make the Grignard reagent. 
This is why we learned in the previous lecture how to make Grignards. So how do we do that? Well, it involves a reaction that we've learned before. We learned it in the alcohol section when we were learning all the alcohol reactions. And if you remember this one, if you have an alcohol and you add PBr3 or SOCl2 or the like, you can do this reaction and you will turn the OH into the Br. That was the quick product method that we discussed before. And there it is. We get the alkyl halide there. And remember, all we have to do to make the Grignard is add Mg. And I'm using THF this time as a solvent. Works pretty good. And the member, the Mg, will sandwich between the carbon and the Br. So here it is. This is our synthesis. The answer to the question is to make this molecule on the right from the molecule on the left, number one, you would add PBr3 first. Then two, you'll add the Mg. Step three, you add the epoxide. And remember, the acid is a separate step, so we would have to call him step four. Now, don't get overwhelmed with this. You might be thinking, oh, that's great, but geez, I would never think about that on a test. I would never think that way. Well, remember, uh, definitely not the first time you wouldn't think this. That's why I'm showing you this strategy. You have to see it first before you're able to think to use it. And remember, I gave you the clue here. The clue was whenever you need to add carbons to a molecule and create an alcohol, you might want to consider Grignard with an epoxide. Let's look at another one here. Let's say sample problem to synthesize the following molecule again. The one on the left needs to turn into the one on the right. What do we want to do here? Let's make some general observations. Notice it looks like we want to add a carbon, a methyl group, to this carbon right here. And look at the oxygen right here. Doesn't look like he made it to the product. Doesn't look like he's there. Meaning this, again, this carbon right here, looks like we want to add a methyl to him. And we don't want the oxygen. So somehow we have to get rid of that oxygen. Well, again, think about that. You are adding carbons. If you're going to add a carbon to a molecule, that's a key thing to think of Grignard reagents. You might want to use one. And here's even more of a clue to use a Grignard. Our molecule that we're starting with is an epoxide. And we already know Grignards react with epoxides. So maybe this is where you want to start. Instead of using retrosynthesis, you might think, well, let me get that methyl group onto the ring. And I know that I can add a Grignard to that epoxide. So let's think of it this way. I want to add one carbon to that ring. So my Grignard reagent should be one carbon big, CH3MGBr. If I did this, remember, I'd have to follow it up, of course, with good old H3O+. And I would get this thing right here as a result. Now, let's make sure we understand what happened here. The methyl member on the Mg is nucleophilic. He would attack the epoxide. We have a nice symmetrical epoxide there, so it doesn't matter which side we attack as long as we attack one of them. So I'm going to have him attack that carbon, which means this methyl right here is the methyl that we added right here. And then remember, after this happens, remember the bond and the epoxide ring here, the electrons jump up on top of this O right here. That oxygen is then protonated by H3O+, which leaves us with an OH right here in red. So that's the connection there. Notice, um, so far, so good. I got my methyl attached now. Now I have an OH. But notice again, let's look at our product here. Not only is the OH not there in the product, but there's also a double bond. And right there, that should give you a little clue. We want to get rid of the OH, and we want to make the double bond. Just the fact that you want to make a double bond should make you think some type of elimination reaction. And again, we've learned this before in a previous lecture. We learned that if you use an alcohol, remember OHs are not good leaving groups, if you react them with a certain acid, the acid will protonate the alcohol into water, making him a much better leaving group now, and force an elimination reaction. And if you remember correctly, there was one specific acid that did that. It was H2SO4 in heat. The name of the reaction was called dehydration of an alcohol. And what that H2SO4 did is, again, protonate the oxygen and force the E1 mechanism. So there it is. We would get that as a product. This is our synthesis. Number one, the first thing we would do is react the Grignard. Number two, then we'll protonate the oxygen. Then we will, number three, add H2SO4 to finish this off.
That is our synthesis. Remember, these are just guidelines to get you to start thinking about when and how to use these particular reactions. Okay, you got to practice a lot more than this to get a really good feel for this. So let's look at our key points. What was it all about? Number one, we saw that organic lithium and Grignard reagents play a nucleophilic role. We saw number two, Grignard reagents attached to the less substituted or more accessible carbon in an epoxide ring, very base promoted here. Number three, Grignard reagents can be quenched by protons, which means, remember, they react with water or alcohols and can be protonated. Therefore, if we're going to use them in reactions, we might want to take care of that acidic proton first before we use the Grignard reagent.